Um, what's good, everybody? <clears throat> um, today, you know, finally have another hangout. I know y'all been wondering what's been taking so long. I'm real busy. I'm actually back home, and Coach Adam is actually, you know, busy on business. He's been real busy lately, so it's been tough to sit down and get questions from you guys, but I'm glad we can <clears throat> definitely answer some more questions, or at least I can. Um, I want to start today off with pretty much like a little message. I was talking to some um, some girl today, and she said, and she asked me, you know, how's my workout today, because I told her I was working out, and pretty much I said, you know, it was hard, like all my workouts, and she was like, why do you work out so hard? And it hit me, and I was like, why do I work out so hard? <laughs> and it's pretty much, you know, whatever you do in life, you have to go hard at it. If you're going to do it, why do it unless you're going to go hard, you know? So pretty much that that made me remember um, something that my coach in high school had told me. He was like, you guys have to be dedicated, and you have to work harder than everybody. And whatever you do in life, you have to do it as hard as you can, whether you want. He used to tell us, because a lot of dudes would like to holler at girls, or like a lot of dudes would like to party. He was like, he said, if you want to be a basketball player, you need to, you know, go hard at basketball, give it your all every day. If you want to be a partier, then go hard in partying. If you want to be a ladies' man, then go hard at the ladies. But whatever you do in life, you got to go hard. You know what I'm saying? So just so y'all know, outwork, you know, outwork everybody. You got to be willing to work harder than everybody. Everybody's willing to work, but not that many people are willing to work until, you know, they're about to pass out or until they're throwing up. So um, that's just a little message. But all right, so let's get it. The the questions going. Um, feel free. Y'all can ask whatever questions y'all want. It's kind of a dead period right now. Um, so, because there was, there was a little confusion with this hangout, so, but I have a lot of questions from earlier that people were asking, so um, let's see. The first question is, how do, how do impress and not get blacked out in tryouts, and when coaches come to see your game, how do you not get nervous? Well, Pretty much to not get nervous, um, you have to put in hard work every day, and it has to be something that, you know, has to come easy to you. The, the harder you work each day, the more you work, the easier it's going to come to you in the games. And, you know, you should feel comfortable on that basketball court. You shouldn't be thinking about anything. You know, you should just be letting your game flow, just going hard every day, going hard in the game, just letting that game just come to you and you're just in a different world. Like that basketball court should be your sanctuary and you should never be nervous on the court. You should know, you know, you should trust your talents and know if a coach is coming to see you, he's coming to see you for a reason. So, you know, make that reason be known. Next question is how to stay in the zone. Well, first off, you got to get in the zone and pretty much it's similar to the last question I had. You know, getting in the zone is nothing more than playing without any thought, just just letting the game flow. You're not thinking about anything. If you ask guys like Kobe Bryant and LeBron James what it's like to be in the zone, you know, they can't really explain it because they're not thinking about it. Nobody's thinking like, all right, this game I'm going to get in the zone. When you're in the zone, you don't think, all right, I'm going to stay in the zone like, it's just something that you got to figure out. I was reading a book by um, Tim Grover called Relentless, and pretty much what he does with his athletes is he finds their zone. He finds what, you know, puts them in their zone. He finds that point that puts them in the zone, whether it's yelling at them, whether it's talking about their mama or whatever, and something just clicks and puts them in that zone. And you have to figure out what puts you in that zone. And, you know, that'll get you in that zone. And then to stay in there, you just – once you get in the zone, you shouldn't have a problem staying in there because it, it's called the zone for a reason. You don't just hop in and out of it. I mean, it's something that when you get it, 
is great, but it's not easily attainable for people that don't know their body, that don't know their mentality. You have to know yourself, you know, and you have to know, figure out what triggers, you know, you get in the zone. For instance, you have to think about a game, maybe, you know, you was having an all right game, and somebody says, so it's talking trash to you, and then that puts you over the edge, and that puts you in your zone. So now you know when people talk trash to you, you get in the zone. So why not when the game starts, you know, you start, you just do little things to get the other guy, guy, you know, riled up and then let him start talking trash. You know, let him get you in your zone. And then you should just stay there because, like I said, once you get in it, you don't know you're in it. So you're not like, all right, I got to stay in here. got to stay in here. You just, you're going to stay in your zone unless you just have no killer mentality. But everybody got that killer in them. So, I mean, we're humans. That's, you know. How can you play and score against taller and more physical players than you? Um, you have to get stronger first off to play against guys taller and more. If somebody's more physical than you. I mean, and that's you got to get mentally stronger and physically stronger because I know guys that are skinny and they'll punk dudes on the court just because that mental toughness and you know they're they're not gonna get they the, they're the ones that start the physical play like you have to be able to initiate physical play you can't be the guy that gets you know flustered when somebody plays physical you have to be willing to accept that physicality and you should be initiating it that will definitely make you just a more physical player when you play against taller players use your size to an advantage I um I was reading an article with J J Barea one time. And it was like, don't you ever feel bad? You're so short. And he was like, why would I feel bad? You know, I'm, yeah, I'm short, so I'm going to use my strengths over, you know, yeah, they may be bigger than me, but they're not quicker than me. You know, they can't stop me from getting by them. And that's how you got to attack the game. You know, every big guys have, you know, strengths and weaknesses. So do small guys. Like, I'm a small guy. I'm 5'10", but I don't think anybody can stay in front of me, you know. I know guys that's 5'5", five, five, and they're hard to stay in front of. You have to use your strengths and, you know, try to hide your weaknesses as much as possible and attack the big guys' strengths. Guys that are taller than you, you know that they can't guard you. They're slower than you. Um, how do you warm up before a weight room workout and have, like, 15-meter space? Um, that's – pretty much a simple dynamic warm up you could do standing leg kicks you could do um standing you know lunges in the same place you know stationary lunges stationary leg kicks you could do um what do we do with what's um coach Adam and I do like don you could do donkey kicks you can do um dang what's the name of those I cannot remember where you lay on your back and you kind of bring your leg, like you kick your leg on the side of you. I forgot what that was called, but we do those to stretch, you know, to get your hip flexors loose. There's a lot of things you could do stationary. I mean, being stationary, not having a lot of space has nothing to do about getting a good warm-up for weightlifting especially. And maybe for basketball, you might want to have a little more space so you can run, maybe run some short, acceleration sprints but if you're just in the weight room you could do it you could get warm stationary is your cardio wait if your cardio is good how will it actually benefit you in the game in game situations mentally and physically well I mean being in better shape will put you in better position both mentally and physically because one you're not you're not gonna get tired like the other guys I mean, everybody knows if you're tired, you know, your your the bad habits that you have start coming back. Your shooting technique might be off. I mean, a lot of bad things happen when you're tired, and that's the reason why it'll seem like you're not as mentally tough. If you're in great shape, you know, your your mental toughness doesn't even have to kick in as much. So, I mean, 
being in shape is obviously when when I went from high school to college, I would say that was the hardest thing was understanding college shape versus high school shape because I thought I was in shape because I played every day. I was like, yeah, I'm in shape. That wasn't the case because when it got time, we was running like 800s on the track, 200s on the track. Man, we was doing all types of stuff. It was it was crazy, crazy. So you you'll really find out what type of shape you are in. You'll definitely figure out what type of shape you are in. You know when you get to that next level, but you know go to the track. Do sprints, do hills. This morning I did hills, like this big hill. That, that joint is huge. I was about to pass out, but, you know, that's how you get in shape. Not just playing basketball. Any good coaching techniques? I coach once a week, and I'm going to be doing my coach exam soon. Um, as being a coach, you definitely have to study other coaches. You know, Coach K is a great coach. Um I like Coach Calipari a lot. Not not necessarily his system, you know, their systems. I, I would like something a little more ball movement, but you know, ball moving the ball oriented or whatever. But I like the way how Coach Calipari communicates with his players and has a, for instance, they say a players first mentality as a coach. And I feel the biggest. See, a lot of coaches think they're great coaches or a lot of people think coaches are great coaches because they know their X's and O's. That's just half the – that's just half the, you know, the battle or whatever you want to call it. Knowing your X's and O's is good, but the whole other side of that is knowing your players, knowing how to handle your players, knowing how to calm them down, knowing how to, you know, get them ready for games. And that's one part of the game that coaches – definitely don't I think they struggle in a lot of coaches you know a lot of coaches have that type of mentality where they want to be the the ones to be the boss if you have players that want to play for you then there's nothing I mean no matter the plays you have no matter how good of a coach you are if your players don't want to play for you you will never win games point blank period the players are the ones that go out there and win the games you can get them ready as much as you want but if they're not willing to you know, dive on that floor for you, if they're not willing to, you know, go hard for you, then you're not going to win. So you definitely have to build a good relationship with your players. You know, learn from other coaches, learn some coaching tips. Um, I, as a coach, I was assistant varsity coach last year. I, as a coach in the school that I coach at, we like to do a lot of pressing and defensive changing because, you figure most teams only have one good ball handler, maybe two. If you press the whole game, you tire them out. The practices are better if you have pressing, I mean, both sides pressing the whole way. I mean, it's just a better practice, more intense. So, you know, I was, I was in practice, I was trying to get the practices harder than the games or as close as possible. So when they get to the games, the games are easy. Um, definitely, I mean, there's a lot of things with coaching. Definitely, I, I recommend, you know, looking, studying some other coaches, studying how they do things, how they communicate with their players. Like I said, Coach Krzyzewski is a great one. Coach Calipari is a great one. Those are, those are, oh, Rick Pitino. Rick Pitino and Calipari are my favorite, but Coach K, I mean, everybody, you have, I don't even like Duke, but you have to, like, respect what they do, so. But, um, yeah, so that's pretty much for the coaching. It's definitely... You know, you could definitely just just relate with your players, and that will get them. You know, that would make your team better. If the, if the players are playing for you, then, you know, you're doing something right. What to do when your hand is sweaty and you don't get good grip on the ball? Um, wipe off your hands, I guess. I don't know. I never have this problem, but I guess Steve Nash, what he does is licks his fingers. I mean, if you're worrying about stuff like that, I mean, you're worrying about too much, too many things. Like getting grip on the ball shouldn't be a, you know, really a priority. You should that should just happen. I mean, I've never played a game where I didn't have a good grip of the ball. 
unless you're playing with a terrible basketball. Um, let's see. How can you get a better playing mentality? Well, first I would say get Freak System by Coach Adam Lincoln Auger. It's a great program, mentality-based program. But other than that, just, you know, setting goals, playing against, you know, playing against yourself. You know, don't play down to the competition. Um, just that game mentality, like, you have to take each game personal. One of my coaches used to tell me this. He played in Germany for about... 10 years and he played on the Mavericks for a year or two I think uh, I think I think just one year and then he went back to Germany to play but um he used to tell me like you have to take every game personal like think about the person in front of you trying to stop you is pretty much trying to stop you from feeding your family I mean it's either like you got to you got to destroy him or you know, or he's going to destroy you, so you definitely have, oh wait, hold up guys, alright, finally getting some questions, some other questions in, but alright, so yeah, pretty much, you have to take the games personal, you have to, you know, that's the main thing, take each game personal, that dude in front of you is trying to stop you from feeding your family, are you going to let him do that, I don't think so, alright, let's see, next, Question. All right, hold on. Let me let me answer some of these questions. All right. How to play the post offensively when you're smaller than the defender? Um. Use your body. If you are smaller than your defender, I don't know why you would take him to the post. I would take him outside where he can't guard you. I mean, if you're playing the post against a taller defender. Oh wait, if you're playing versus small. Yeah, if you're smaller than your defender. So if you're playing against a dude taller than you, I mean, that you're playing to his strength. You want to play to his weakness to your strength, which would be take him outside. So I would definitely say play to your strengths. But if you have to take him in the post, you might have a play where you're in the post. I don't know. So if you are in the post, then use your body. You know, use them elbows. Don't elbow, but, you know, create that space. And you just got to be physical. You cannot – be in the post and not be physical. You have to be physical. I run six miles a day. Is that going to benefit me for basketball? No. Six miles a day is not going to benefit you for basketball. Like That could kill your explosiveness, your vertical. Um, six miles a day is bad for basketball. Very bad. I, I wouldn't even recommend running a mile a day. I would recommend doing sprints. Because if you're doing all that running... You're killing your vertical jump, and you're killing your explosiveness. You'll be slow. you got to think how a basketball game works. You're not running six miles straight. You know, you're running 20 seconds dead ball, 10 seconds foul, 20 seconds timeout. Like, that's how you have to train for basketball. Can can be guarded, be done with the ball handling program with, wait, uh, one day, two, that do ball handling, so on. Um, yeah, you could do that. I mean, I don't know how how strenuous your other program is. If it's too strenuous, you don't want to do it every day because, you know, you could overwork yourself. So you don't want to do that. How does a player assess their strengths and weaknesses when you play a game and get only one touch? Man, you're going to have to get more touches, honestly. Um you, I would say, you know, pick it up on defense, maybe, you know, get some steals so you can get the ball. You're going to have to start coming in with a different mentality demand in the basketball. I mean, I don't know your skill level if if you're not as good as you want to be and that's why you're not getting the ball, then, you know, just keep working in that gym, get better so you can be the person that gets more touches. What exercise can I do at home to increase my vertical? Um... You can't really do any at home to increase. I mean, you could do. I mean, to increase your vertical, you have to get stronger. So you could do body weight stuff at home. But if you really want to increase your vertical, you have to find a weight room, and you know you have to find a gym where you can work on your technique and stuff like that. It'll be tough to 
just get a 40 inch vert sitting at I mean at home doing stuff how can I master the, the footwork for the sham god move um, I, w I would say do it without a ball and just you know simulate it without the ball and then that might help you get the you know learn how to do it how can you cut through tight defense and finish strong hard and strong at the rim um, you have to be quick you know you have to be strong to finish strong at the rim you have to be a stronger guy you know what I'm saying gotta be a strong dude you got you know if you have a the better your vertical is the better you'll be able to finish around the rim so if you get stronger you'll get a better vertical I can't seem to move my body correctly when doing the Irisan crossover. I can't move my body as wide. What should I do? Um, I would do the same thing I had told um, Funny Ray Vids is practice without the ball in your hand. Just get that rhythm down of, you know, it like it's, all, it's like you're dancing, seriously. So, you know, just get that rhythm down just every time, you know, just get that down. And then add the ball and before you add the ball you know you could just do regular crossovers with the ball just so you get that hand feeling of the ball switching hands back and forth and then you add the crossover with it what's the best way to train your non-dominant hand I'm a lefty so I can make left hand layups in traffic but I miss open right hand layups um just you know practice Right, if you know you can make left handed layups, I would, you know, in practices, I would do say you do you're doing a layup drill and you have to make 10 layups each hand. I would make 20 with my left hand, I mean, with my right hand. If I were you, I make 20 with my weak hand and 10 with my regular hand. Get those extra reps with your weak hand so it's not weak anymore. Um, how can I get no pressure when I'm playing I get nervous as hell <laughs> man that's all about trusting trusting yourself knowing that you put in the work and trusting your game I mean if you put in that if you go hard every day in practice and you know that you work harder than everybody when it comes to that game there'll be no pressure no nervousness cuz you'll know like yeah man I'm I work too hard for this I can you know you'll know that you can do it so definitely you gotta go hard and practice and when you're working out you have to take your workouts to another level so when you get in the game the game is nothing what do you do in one-on-one -on -one if your defender has long hands and he mans you up or gives you no space and not really let you move around um, get physical with him smack his hand out the way you know gives you no space blow by him or create that space bump into him you know you gotta get physical with especially with those long dudes you gotta get physical you gotta smack his hand away you gotta do a lot of things to you know just get physical with the guy and show him that yo I mean if somebody gets up on me and you shoulder him in that in his chest he not gonna stay up on you that that much any longer no dude believe me it's like in boxing like no dude wants to get punched in the mouth you know no dude wants to get shouldered in the chest so that I mean just catch him off guard boom one time he'll back up believe me he'll back up if he doesn't then I mean you're gonna have to figure something else out like if he's a physical dude you're gonna have to create that space and blow by like he can't be physical and stay in front of you at the same time like you have he has to give something and that second he gives something you gotta take it how can I be aggressive on offense without being a ball hog? Um, without being a ball hog. Well, a ball hog to me, it's not always. See, some guys think they're a ball hog. If you have to score for your team to win, that's not a ball hog. Like Kobe, people say he's a ball hog. He's a score. Like if if I know he can give me forty to fifty points, I'ma let him. It, you know, you're not a ball hog if you scoring and you being aggressive is better for your team. 
with that being said, if you being aggressive is making the team lose, then that will make you look like a ball hog. Nobody said nothing to Michael Jordan when he was taking 30 shots a game and they were winning championships. But I guarantee before, you know, before Jordan won that, a lot of people don't remember. A lot of you guys are too young. I was young. But people don't remember that. Before Jordan won his first title, people were saying the same things about him that they said, well, not about LeBron. Like, LeBron, they don't call him a ball hog. But they were saying the same things about Jordan, saying he'll never win a championship. He's just a ball hog. He's just – all he wants to do is score. He'll never win a championship. Like, people don't realize, like, it's serious. When you win, all the bad things go away. You know, all the bad things go away. So if you are aggressive and you guys are winning, no, you don't have to worry about anybody calling you a ball hog. Now, if you're aggressive and you're losing, then people might call you a ball hog. But to be aggressive on offense doesn't mean you have to shoot the ball. You know, you could be aggressive – cause double teams and pass. You can be aggressive and score. You could be aggressive on defense. You know, you could just be an aggressive player. If you are putting in your effort in offense, defense, passing, everything, people will not call you ball hog, believe me. How to not overwork yourself. I mean, you have to know your body. Honestly, a lot of a lot of, you know, the athletes I train have no idea what overworking yourself is because they don't work hard. Ha they don't even work close to hard enough that you need to actually overwork your body. But you know, I, like lifting weights to every day, you know, that's you could overwork yourself. But going, you know, if you're just getting shots up, you can get shots up every day. But if you're going hard, how you should be, like some people just stand and shoot. Like yeah, you could do that every day, but that's not a good basketball workout. Like you're just taking practice shots that you will never take in a game. You probably will not overwork yourself unless you are lifting hard every day, working out hard every day, and not taking no breaks. That is how, you know, you could overwork yourself. Like today, all right, this morning I ran hills, and I lifted hard in the weight room. Then the evening I went to the gym and I only worked out for, you know, did a basketball skill workout for like 30 minutes because I know anything longer than that, I wouldn't have been able to go hard. Now, tomorrow, I'll probably take tomorrow off. And that's how you don't work overwork yourself. Your body needs that rest. That rest is when your muscles grow, when your muscles, you know, get rejuvenated. You need the rest. So overworking yourself is hard, but, you know, I don't think a lot of people will overwork themselves. Like your your concern shouldn't be overworking yourself. I think your con a lot of athletes' concern should be training properly and work and training the correct way. What is your best ball handling drill that's proven to work for your athletes? Um, let's see. Most of my ball handling drills are drills involved with scoring, you know, involved with, like, I'll never do, for a warm-up, I will do stationary ball handling drills just to warm up, get the hands warm. But when I come to, when it comes to drills, I rarely focus on just ball handling as a section. Like, I'll do, you know, ball handling moves into a pull-up jump shot. You know, it, ball handling is just something of comfort and pretty much, all right, I'll give you a quick, you know, a drill that I would do if I were you. I would start at the, start at like half court. And you don't even have to start that far. You could start like the volleyball line. Dribble hard to the top of the key. Do a double crossover, Tim Hardaway cross. Pull up at the elbow. You know, get your rebound, run back, Tim Hardaway cross, other direction, pull up at the elbow. And those are the type of things I do for ball handling. You know, then the next time, you know, after you, you know, say, say you do 10 makes. After that, next time do a Tim Hardaway cross, but this time, you know, between the legs, behind the back, pull up. And then I might do, then I'll start mixing it up when I do between the legs. I'll do the double cross, step back you know, spin move, you know, I just mix it up. I do a lot of different things that I think might happen in the game. So when it happens in the game, I've been practicing it. 
and I don't even think about it. It just happens. Like people always ask you think about your moves, and you have to you have to master every move to the point in the game. You're not even thinking about it because basketball is a reaction game. Somebody comes this way, boom, you cross. If they don't come, you you hesitate and go. I mean, it's that fast. But in practice, you have to practice all the scenarios. How can you practice finishing at the rim and finishing hard by yourself? Um, you could practice finishing at the rim. Just practice doing a lot of crafty things. Um, I'm big on finishing, being able to finish a whole lot of different ways. I like when I do finishing at the rim drills with my athletes, I like to do things where they do regular layups. Then they do reverse layups. Then they do same hand, same foot layups. You know, just a whole bunch of different layups because in the game you never know. Like you should be able to jump off whatever foot, finish with other hand, with, finish with whatever hand, finish in, in the front rim, the side rim, off the backboard. You should be able to finish at all those different positions. And that will make you, you know, a better finisher. Finishing hard is just about, when it comes to finishing hard, that's about, you know, jumping in games into the opponent's chest and focusing on the rim and not letting that contact mess up your shot or mess up your finishing around the rim. What do you do if your teammates don't know how to help you get open? If you're the primary scorer on your team, meaning what should I do to score if my teammates can't help? Um, well, I think this has to do some, you know, with your coach as well. When I was, like, I know when I played, a lot of teams would run a box and one on me. Pretty much all we would do is run me through a lot of screens. I mean, I was the point guard, so they would guard me full court, not even let me get the ball. So I would just let the other guy bring it up. They run me through a lot of screens. I would get the ball, and then we would just spread the court and just let you know let me take my man one on one. Of course, I'll beat him if somebody helps. I kick to somebody. If nobody helps, I take it to the rim. I mean, it's not that hard if you have a good system with you know if you have a good coach. Like my coach knew where to put the other players, and they knew what to do. If I drove this way, they knew what to do. If I drove that way, they knew what to do. If I was going to pull up, you know, it's all about how good your team, the team chemistry is. And it sounds to me like you don't have a good team. Sometimes, man, you're just going to have to, like, put that team on your back and figure something out. But I would say try to get the ball as soon as possible. For you, what do you think when people compare LeBron to Kobe? Um, I mean, they're both great players, and they're both completely different players. Kobe has a, you know, Kobe's the closest thing to Michael Jordan with his mentality and his game, but that's not saying Kobe is, you know, better than LeBron, and I'm not saying that LeBron might not be better than Michael Jordan one day, like, LeBron James, people just don't, you know, he has a lot of haters and people don't want to give him credit, but, you know, he could go down as the best basketball player ever. Just the things he does with the ball, you know, it's just amazing. People take for granted, you know. Like, think about it. Like, if LeBron gets 25, 6, and 6, that's an off night for LeBron James. Like, the dude is amazing. Him, I mean, you can't really compare the two. The two completely different players. Kobe is a killer. He wants to drop 50 every game. LeBron, you know, he'd rather have a triple double every game. You know, so that's that's the difference. Um, it's hard to compare the two. They're both great players, and you know, I love watching both of them play. Um. In your opinion, what is the most perfect training schedule that makes you the best player in the shortest time? Well, in my opinion, the most perfect training schedule is my program that I just released called Can't Be Guarded Scoring System. And, you know, it consists of workouts for about 45, you know, that lasts about 45 minutes to an hour. It's how I train in college. It's how, you know, 
the pros train. It's how the top Division One schools train. Like when you're in college, and we have individual workouts, you don't do, you know, you don't practice for two hours by yourself. You know, the individual workouts are 30 minutes, 45 minutes, up to an hour of just hard drills getting you better. And people think, you know, because they're short, they're not good. That's where people are wrong. The hard, you know, the shorter they are, now you don't want a, some 10-minute workout. Like, you want to get all the skills in, but the shorter it is, the harder you can go. Once, once you eclipse an hour, then it gets to the point where you just can't go as hard as you want. Is 20 minutes of hill sprints long enough sprinting up or walking, sprinting up, jogging or walking down? Yeah, 20 minutes is long enough. Like, like today I did 10, I just did 10 hill sprints. I sprinted up, jogged down. Well, I jogged down most of them, but at the end I had to walk down because I was dying. It was hot and I wasn't trying to die out there, but um, 20 minutes, yeah. I mean, you should probably need maybe like 10 to 15, I mean 10, 15, 20 minutes. Just whatever, you know, go at your pace, and the better shape you get, the less time it'll take you. But yeah, hill sprints are hill sprints is like sprinting with weights, pretty much. Like hill sprints are great. Like they're my favorite thing to do to get in shape. Hill sprints. <laughs> Trevor White said they had a bad coach. Yeah, man, if you have a bad coach. It'll, it'll be hard. Um, how can you continue to get better on recovery days? Um, on on recovery days, I, what I like to do, I, I mean, I'm a YouTube head. I love watching YouTube. I love watching players, you know, like Chris Paul, Kyrie Irving. Like Kyrie Irving, he's like my favorite player to watch now. But I love watching players like Steve Nash. J.J. Barea, people are like my size. Well, Kyrie Irving's like 6'2 or 6'3, but mostly guys like, you know, Nate Robinson, J.J. Barea, Chris Paul, Allen Iverson, guys that are my height and still killed in the, you know, in the league. And you could pick up things from them that you have to figure if a dude's 5'10 and he's in the NBA, then he's super good. And if he's scoring 20 points a game in the NBA, then he's super, super good at 5'10". So you got to look at what is he doing. You know, what is he doing? What moves is he doing? How is he playing so well at such a high level? And then, you know, you, you pick up little things. I don't try to play. You cannot try to play like like somebody. You can't just watch Chris Paul and be like, all right, I'm going to play exactly like Chris Paul. You got to play like you and just add things from everybody's game. So in recovery days, to get better – is take recovery serious, eat healthy, foam roll. You know, if you got a girlfriend, tell her to give you a massage or something like get your body right. And then watch, you know, if you have film of yourself, watch yourself, watch, you know, what could you have done better? You could watch your jump shooting technique. If you want, you know, you could watch your, your jumping technique. If you want to add inches to your vertical, you could do a lot of different things on recovery days. And then some recovery days, you just, like weekends, I just take off completely. I don't think about basketball. All right, well, that's a lie. I, I think about basketball all the time. But, you know, I try not to think about basketball. I'll go to the movies. I'll go out to eat with my friends or go bowling or something. Just really just rest your mind and rest my body, you know, just rest physically and mentally from the game, especially on weekends. So when that week starts, I'm back ready to, you know, hit the weights hard because by the time Sunday night hits, I'm like, dang, I cannot – Stop thinking about working out. Like last night, I went to the movies, you know, with my cousins and, you know, some pretty girls. And all I could think the whole time the movies was about my workout today. And I, you know, got up, ran hills, almost passed out, went to the gym, lifted hard. Like you have to have that hunger. And that hunger comes from taking days off and recovering. How can you make your shot much quicker? You can make your shot much quicker. I think, matter of fact, I'm going to post a video on this channel probably in like two days on how to get a quicker release. But it's, it's all about footwork, being ready to shoot before you even catch the ball, and then, you know, catching the ball and shooting. Kind of 
not all at once, not rushing your shot, but, you know, just being able to, instead of catching the ball, bending down, shooting, being able to already be low, already stepping into your shot, so when you catch the ball, you just go up with it, you know what I'm saying? So that's how you get a quicker release. What helps in beating your defender off the... Oh, wait, hold on, my bad. I'm used to cool. I always play with guys who are taller than me, and I always end up shooting the ball instead of driving because I'm afraid to get blocked. How can I drive without getting blocked? Um, use your body. And one thing I see young, young, you know, high school, I'm not sure how old you are, but and I'm not sure your level of talent, but... A lot of things I see problems, that, a lot of things that I see wrong that kids do is to drive, they take too many dribbles to get to the basket, and it gives time for the help defense to recover. Well, it gives time for the help defense to come over, and it gives time for your man to recover so you get blocked. One thing you need to do is practice being at the free throw line, I mean at the three-point line, taking one dribble and being able to finish. If you could, If you could finish in one dribble from anywhere on the court, like, from the three-point line, anywhere around that area, if you're on the wing and you can just catch, sweep, one dribble, finish, that split second, that split second right there is the difference in you getting blocked or you finishing. So definitely work on just those quick, you know, one dribble, boom, finish. What helps in beating your defender off the dribble? Dorsey flexion. I don't know if you know what that is, but... That helps your first step a lot. Dorsey flexion, um, being physical with your guy. Like, well, I always do it. Like, a lot of guys, you know, like, if they reach, I just smack their hand away. It's, it's quick. Refs don't even see it. Just when I beat, you know, beat them, hesitation by them. And when they reach out, you know, just smack their hand away. That little smack will throw them off balance and you'll beat them easy. Once you beat them, Get in front of them, you know, shield them with your body. Let the help defense come. If it doesn't come, pull up in the lane. If it does come, dish to your big man. I mean, basketball is a simple game. It's a game of angles. A lot of people make it a lot more challenging than it should be. So I just want to point out that I've been doing camera guard for a week, and my shot has improved a lot. I can finally shoot over my head, and now it's automatic. Hey, no problem, man. That, those are the type of results that I like to hear. Um, I definitely, you know, was anticipating you guys to enjoy the program. I didn't think you guys would like it this much, um, but I did work hard on it. And, you know, it just makes me happy that so many people are enjoying Can't Be Guarded. I set it at a nice price for you guys. Because I want everybody to get better, all my athletes to get better. So I'll definitely be coming out with some, some new things shortly, but right now Can't Be Guarded. Um, it's definitely, definitely something, something different than what all the other trainers, you know, have been putting out. So I'm glad y'all are enjoying it. Um, let's see. If one is tall, should they still dribble low or, sh or should anyone, which should be the height of a dribble while driving, standing? All right. Pretty much what he's trying to ask is should you drill you should be as low as you can when you're dribbling the ball. I mean, you know, the lower you are, the better. The harder you are to guard. I mean it's a, it's always a saying, the lower you are if you're lower than your defender, then he can't stay in front of you. Pretty much if you are lower than your defender, it makes the game pretty easy. That's why little guys like you know, Nate Robinson, like J.J. Barea, are so hard to stay in front of because they're so small. They're so close to the ground. One, you can't rip them because their dribble is so quick. Taller guys, if they don't get low, it takes the ball longer to get their hand after to get to their hand after they dribble. That gives it easier. That gives a better chance for people to steal it. Stuff like that. So the smaller you are, or the lower you get, the less time the ball is out of your hand or out of or not touching the ground. So definitely um, the lower you get the better. But you don't want to be to the point where you're uncomfortable 
with that being said, you want to practice being as low as possible so you are comfortable being that low no matter your height. I want to jump higher and I'll do Become a Freak on December full time, but I don't want to lose my skill work. I'm aiming to dunk next year. Should I retrain my skills after I'm able to dunk or well, see, you have to you have to think about what is your goal. If your goal is to be a better basketball player, then you can't just stop doing skills just to dunk because you know, dunking is believe I mean, don't get me wrong, dunking is amazing, the best feeling in the world, but if you're a basketball player, you want your skills to be just, you know, at, athleticism and skills are just as important as each other. I would say, like, some, some trainers like to say skills is the most important. Some trainers like to say athleticism is imp the most important. Coach Adam and I both agree that they are both equally important you can have a guy that has all the skills in the world, but if he's not athletic, he's just another guy with skills. And then you have guys that are freak athletes, but they can't dribble the ball. They can't shoot. You have to have a mix of them both. So, you know, if your goal is to be, a, you know, just to dunk, then, yeah, don't do skills and just do become a freak. If your goal is just to be skills, you know, don't do become a freak, but I recommend you doing, you know, a skill like can't be guarded with become a freak. I mean, become a freak's the best. I feel can't be guarded is the best basketball training program, and become a freak is the best vertical jump program. The best. It's not just vertical jump; it's athleticism, just getting you overall strong. And in basketball, if you watch how the game's going now, Russell Westbrook, Derrick Rose. All them dudes is athletic, man. If you're not athletic and you don't have skills, you're not going to make it to the level you want to be at. You have to have both. Um, good examples of healthy foods to add on diets. I eat potato and rice for carbs and chicken and tenderloins and eggs for proteins, but I'm fed up with those. All right. Um, some proteins you can eat, fish, steak, you know, any type of meat. And then with carbs, you can eat, well, potatoes and rice. You can have oats. You know, I pretty much eat rice. All, I'm Puerto Rican, so I eat rice all the time. It don't bother me. But, I mean, if you're tired of rice, if you're tired of potatoes, maybe eat some oatmeal. I mean, fruits, you know, they have good carbs in them. Stuff like that. Um, if you're in a rush to hoop and you just... What the? Uh, all right. I don't even understand that question. How do I play aggressive without being a ball hog? Oh, somebody asked me that. All right. We're well, working on your wrist and hand flexibility. Help your shooting the ball. Um, I mean, I guess it will. I mean, I don't know. Your hand, your wrist should be fairly flexible. I mean, I broke this wrist. Y'all can see. Hold on. Y'all can see the the scar. I don't know if you can. It's right right there. I broke my wrist and this wrist it's not as flexible as this one, but I still shoot fairly well, still handle the ball well. So I mean you want to be flexible in your wrist, I guess. I don't know why you wouldn't be flexible in your wrist though. Um Yeah, no problem, Trevor. Um, how do you send fear in, in the opponent's eyes? Oh, shit. Okay. But um, how to send fear into the opponent's eyes? Um, the way you get fear into your opponent is just having that man, you know, that confidence to let them know that you're the alpha male. Like, you got to step in that gym and you got to know. And they got to know that you are the man. That is fear. You know, do little tricks. I don't know if you can dunk, but, you know, one thing I like to do, if I like if I walk into a gym, most people, like around here, they already know me, so they're already scared. But if I go to a gym that people don't know me, one thing I'll do, you know, I just do, I shoot some long threes, 
like super long, just let people know, you know, I'm not playing. And then I'll, you know, my favorite dunk that I could do is off the backboard dunk. Then I'll just, you know, be chilling. And then after their game, everybody's talking, joking. I'll just throw the ball off the backboard and dunk it. And then right from there, they're like, oh, shoot. Like they see me, you know, dunk and they see me hit a long three. They're already like, oh, my God, like, dang. And then after that, you know, you already got them beat. But you got, just have to do little tricks like that. How do I need to step up and be a leader on the court? That's all about, you know, being a leader on the court starts in practice. It starts off the court, being a good student, being the person that's not out partying and in the gym, extra time, being at practice, you know, finishing suicide, finishing suicides first, talking you know, being a leader, you have to communicate with your coach, with your teammates. A leader, you know, you have to you have to be a workhorse because nobody's going to want to follow somebody that doesn't work hard. Nobody's going to want to follow somebody that, you know, isn't passionate about the game. And nobody's going to want to follow somebody that doesn't care about them. If you, you know, just because you communicate and you talk on the court doesn't mean you have to be, you know, be an asshole about it. When I'm on the court, I never give negative feedback. I always give positive reinforcement. If somebody misses a shot, it could be a terrible shot. And I'll tell them, like, yo, good shot, man. That's cool. Like, shoot again. You always got to give that positive reinforcement because when you do something, people ain't going to care. Like, if I shoot a bad shot, nobody's going to say nothing because I let them shoot bad shots. So to be a leader, you have to Treat your, you know, treat your players with respect and let them know that they can trust you. Let your coaches know that they can trust you, and that comes from work, outworking everybody every day on the court. If people see you working hard, there's no way that they cannot listen to what you have to say. Oh man, you guys are crushing me with some questions today. I like that though. <laughs> I'm 6'1 and have a 20-inch vertical. How could I get up to jump higher? First, you need to get on a good program, become a freak. Um, hold on, let me, let me, t wait, let me type this in the chat for you guys. Go to your, yourjumptraining.com slash products slash become a freak me too. All right. If y'all go to that that website, that's um, become a freak. That's the best vertical jump program on the market. I'm not even playing. Like, it's the best. And um, you need a pro. If you want to jump higher, you need a program. It's not something that happens overnight. It takes time. It takes hard work, dedication. I didn't start dunking until I was 21 years old. And I played at a high level in basketball. And, you know, once I was done playing competitively, I was like, well, what else can I do? You know, and being able to dunk was one of those things. And it it was frustrating at times, but it was a long road. But like I said before, there's nothing like dunking. There's no better feeling like dunking. So... That is definitely, you know, should get that. Um, freak jump technique is another great one that you could add instant inches to your vertical. If you have a 20 inch vertical right now, I mean, you could, you'll see a lot of results because you just don't have a lot of, you know, experience in jumping. So, you know, you'll see a lot of results with become a freak and with jump technique. So. But all right, y'all, I will take maybe one or two more questions. I didn't even want this to last this long, but you guys had some great questions tonight. So, you know, we went a little longer than, than I suspected. But like I said, I'll take one or two more questions before I bounce. And I just want y'all to, you know, attack every day like it's your last because you 
you know, you really don't know when is your last day. So every time you work out, every time you're on the court, play like it's your last, train like it's your last day, and just, I mean, go hard, outwork the competition, outwork everybody. Like, the thing I hate seeing is dudes that make it from just God-given talent and they don't work hard. Like, I hate that. I want to see more people make it that work their butt off. And I know my athletes can do it because you guys have the resources. You guys have the programs. All you have to do is put them to use. And y'all y'all are on your way. Uh, 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 uh. All right, hold on. Let me refresh this. See if we have any more questions. Oh, see? All right. I kind of wish I could be at the gym all the time. 13, I try and try and try a lot. I have attitudes. They can't control it. Take it the wrong way. My coach also says I'm too skinny to make the team. How can I change that I'm good? He just said. I mean, a coach shouldn't just look at your size. Like, that's messed up for real, but, um, you know, you just got to play aggressive daily and get physical. Size doesn't always matter. Like, you, I know skin, like I said, I know skinny guys that bully other dudes on the court, and that has to be you. But, all right, y'all, it was nice chatting with y'all. Coach Rock signing off. I'll be back. Let's see. Maybe I'll do another one, like, Thursday or Friday, so y'all get y'all questions ready, and we will be back.